there, YouTube. Bart Earth Racing here. Well, things are starting to get pretty exciting. Because with the addition of the X-axis and this quick change tool post and this weight protector, we're now at the point where you can actually get real work done with this lathe. So what I'm going to do is take a couple minutes and talk through everything we've done since the addition of the Z-axis ball screw that we did in the last video. So the part that's probably easiest to notice is that we now have this thing up here, which is the X-axis housing. So I have this aluminum extrusion. Using the X-car, I cut on the back a NEMA 23 mount flange, tap the holes so that the stepper motor just screws onto it, and there's a pass-through cut on the back that allows me to put through a GT2 timing belt like this, with a, a 60-tooth cog on the top and a 30-tooth cog on the bottom. And then these, there's a little slot here and here, so the bolts that go through it, this whole assembly can move up and down to tighten the belts. These two spacers I just made on the mill, and it picks up the mount holes on the front of the cross slide that the OEM part used to tighten down the cross slide bearing. So I still have the OEM cross slide bearing in here. All I did was take off the hand crank, and I got lucky, it was eight millimeters, that's a standard bore for these GT2 timing cogs, so it just slipped on, tightened down, Bob's your uncle. These two holes here are just access holes because you need to be able to get at the um, Allen bolts that are in there. So he just comes in like that to tighten it down. Really very simple. You just kind of slide everything together, hook the belt over top, drop it down to the belts tight, tighten it up, and we're good. And that is super solid. That's not going anywhere. And it works really well. The only uh, part of the whole thing that was uh, at all difficult was finding the right belt length. So all I did was order a bunch, five millimeters apart, and found one until it worked. And that's that. The second part is we have this BXA wedge style quick change tool post. What this is, is a way to be able to mount the tools to the lathe in such a way that you always know the distance to the control point where the actual cutting edge is. With the OEM style compound, with this OEM style compound, you've got no way to reference it because it doesn't actually hold the tool front to back to any sort of solid reference point. So every time you put that in there, clamp it down to mount a tool, the, the distance has changed. And while you can get kind of close, we're trying to be accurate to the thousands of an inch here, that isn't going to cut it. So we have to get rid of this piece and replace it with something that's a little more repeatable. Uh, the way we did that, on the underside of this part, here's the underside. You can see the cylindrical mount face that drops into a socket inside the cross slide, and there's a pair of bolts that pinch it tight. So we just cut this using this lathe to this diameter, put a groove in it, drilled and tapped it to fit to the M16 bolt that's used to secure the, the quick change tool post, and there we go. So the way that this thing works is this handles the quick release. You just push that, the whole thing slides off. And because you've got this reference nut here that controls its height, and because it's dovetailed to control its uh, distance on the x-axis, every time you put that on there, it comes down to the exact same height, secures in place, and now that tool hits the same spot every single time. What that lets you do is build a tool table so this, for example, will be tool number one. The computer will know the distance in X and Y to the control point, and that means I can do tool changes without having to go ahead and reset the zero every single time. Absolutely necessary for a CNC lathe. You can't do it without one of these things. This particular size, the BXA, is designed for larger lathes, but I wanted the mass to fit this to give it a little more rigidity, and it needs to be tall enough to be able to set the height here, because this is supposed to be used with a compound slide, and I took that off. So you needed a taller one to make sure that it get in there. And even then it wasn't quite enough. This plate here actually comes with the set. You're supposed to mill that down to be a T-slot to fit your compound slide on, on the lathe you have. I just drilled out the whole oversize just so I could slide the bolt through it and just use it as a spacer. I may make one that's a little bit thicker in the future, but uh, so far I've been able to fit both this 5 8 tooling and my half inch tooling. So I think I'm probably good to go. The other major thing we did was install some limit switches. And what limit switches allow you to do is first off, 
prevent the lathe from crashing on this side. This part of the motor will interfere with the carriage. I sized this to try and get 100% full travel. Didn't quite make it. I'm off by about an eighth of an inch. So uh, if you run this thing all the way in, the back of the motor crashes against the carriage. So I've got a switch in there now that trips before it reaches that to prevent me from crashing there. And then on the outboard side, right where it's sitting now, I have a limit switch to reference zero. So I start the machine up, it goes ahead and references out, and now the machine knows where zero is, so I don't have to go and, and uh, try and refigure out where zero is because that changes the offset for the tools. In fact, let's show that process. So I've just started up Mach 4, turning on jogging, and I'll just move X in to some random spot. And now I just go ahead and click on Reference X. And there, you can see it. So it backed off until it hit the limit switch, then moved forward until it untripped it, which gives it a very repeatable zero for use in determining tool offset for the rest of the computer. You can also just go ahead We'll jog that back so we can have a look at this way cover and how the limit switches are mounted. So here you can see the two limit switches. This one here is the home switch as well as the too far away from the, the uh, center line switch. This one here is the I'm about to crash the motor to the carriage limit switch. When those trip it just shuts off the machine so that I can't get myself into trouble. Originally I was going to use a coolant proof limit switch. Saw one on Amazon that looked really good. But it turned out that when it showed up, it looked like that. Which is a uh, giant. It's a very spinal tap-esque miscalculation of scale. So as nice as a limit switch that is, with it being coolant proof and sealed and all the rest of it, can't use it too big. These here are the tabs that moved down to hit the limit switch. Uh, these were just fashioned out of angle aluminum uh, using a uh, bandsaw and my uh, belt sander. There's a little bit of a relief in here and here so when it's mounted to the cross slide it doesn't drag along this apron here. And uh, drilling and tapping four metric three taps into the side of that cast iron piece was uh, a bit of a heart stopper I tell you. It was just asking to break a tap. To mount this rubber way cover again piece of angle aluminum drilled and tapped uh, to fit on there. It's designed to fit, you can see where these profiles are, right along in here in flush. And then to give it something to crank down on, I made these two cylindrical spacers on this lathe that just fit over here and over here. And then it just gets screwed down like that. And that mounts this nice rubber bellows which protects the ball screw and the ways from all the Swarf and other crap that's flying around when this thing's operating. So now that we have limit switches, we have way covers, and we have a tool post, almost everything that's needed for getting this thing to do production work is in place. Uh, it's been tuned so that Z-axis and X-axis are dead nuts on to the thousandth. And uh, well, when I made these two spacers, those were cut out of a single bar like that, and then parted. Uh, I basically told it to go down to half an inch, which is the diameter of the spacer. It's, it's a 500. And uh, I'll be damned if it didn't hit pretty much dead on. At the Over the length of the bar were two inches. It was 500 exactly at the low point and 505 at the high point. The fact that it's got a bit of a taper on it tells me this lathe is twisted, which is not all that surprising given how uh, noodly these bars have got to be and I haven't actually gone and leveled it yet uh, to take the twist out but for just sitting here on the bench take me down to half an inch and it hits it within five thousandths like that's incredible and it was way faster than doing it by hand and having to sneak up on it like I usually do it even turned out that the uh, parting holder that came with this uh, worked out all right once I put a decent parting blade in so notwithstanding some trouble that I had with the uh, carbide one that came in the tool set for these index, or index tools like this. That one's got an aluminum cutting uh, insert in it right now. 
I've also got some carbide ones for steel. A parting tool in steel was not happy, but uh, stainless steel or a uh, high-speed steel parting tool in aluminum was just fine. So uh, we're pretty well done. The only part of this that's missing is the index sensor on the spindle so that we can get RPM controlled feedback and so that we can get an index point so that we can do threading. Uh, that's the only real major part left. Uh, everything else is pretty well done. Some tuning left to do and I gotta do a lot of experimentation with uh, depth of cut and I've yet to try and do anything complex by feeding it something from uh, Fusion 360 but using this conversationally where I just go up, type some G-code into it and, and off she goes uh, it works just fine. In fact, uh, why don't we do some of that? Everybody loves Swarf porn, right? Okay, so I've just written myself a little G-code program that should take this piece of one inch aluminum stock and turn a shoulder down to three quarters of an inch. So uh, let's see if I got it right. And we're done. So it looks like it works. I have to say, I'm, I'm actually pretty happy. This whole thing has come together really very well. Just a little bit more tuning to go, and now this can be considered a production machine. So i got another video I want to do that talks about lessons learned and various pieces on this that uh, has stuff that you should know about if you're going to try and build one of these on your own. But uh, as it sits right now, I have an operating lathe, and I can now use this thing for making stuff other than parts for itself. So I'm calling it a success. This is a CNC adventure that has uh, come to its fruition. That's it for now. Thanks for watching. Let me grab my Peter.